Well, good morning, everyone. I just got to get this out of the way. How many of you are just a little extra tired today? All right. You guys got a little extra chance to sleep than the early service crew, the 8 o'clock crew. I got to bed a little bit late, unfortunately, and had to get up just a little bit earlier. And in the middle of that, I lost an hour of sleep because of time change. So I'm a little bit tired. If I fall asleep, somebody just elbow me if you'll do that. I don't know how you do that, but I, I just got to say, 52 years of living on this earth, I have still not figured out why we change time. What is the purpose? I don't know. <laughs> why do we do this to ourselves? Half the world does it, the other half the world doesn't. How many of you like it here? Hey, let's vote us. Oh, you like the time change? Oh, then we'll just drop it from there. Three people like it, so we'll, we'll stick with it. No, <laughs> I was saying we could, we could petition our uh, senators and all of that to say, hey, uh, I'll vote for you if. Let's do some important business like ditching daylight savings time. Uh, uh, enough said about that. Um, tomorrow night, 5 to 8 uh, p.m. at Chick-fil-A on University, uh, 30 for Freedom is uh, ministry through Speed the Light to... Uh, uh, help women get out of sex trafficking, and you hear about that from time to time here, but uh, a percentage of proceeds tomorrow night at Chick-fil-A on University from 5 to 8 go toward that. So if you don't have dinner plans tomorrow night, that would be a good place to go. It's a good place to go anyway. Uh, we love Chick-fil-A here, and um, we love our, our operators that operate that store since they come to our church, and we know them. You all are asleep? already. Just elbow your neighbor and say, wake up. I saw some pretty big elbows there. All right, well, let's get into the message this morning. Before so, I just want to ask how many of you are familiar with the the terms Google Home or uh, Amazon Alexa? Okay, those are names that are becoming more and more popular in, uh, in our world. Uh, they've been around now for maybe two or three years, I think, ish. And uh, they have uh, really kind of taken over uh, a lot of people's homes. They, uh, these are those smart devices that you can control your, your lighting in your house or your sound or uh, your security or your video or whatever. And uh, those devices, you can talk to them. They recognize your voice. And you can ask them to do all kinds of things. And uh, if you want information, all of that kind of stuff, they're there to do your bidding. Um, more, more of us are familiar with like Siri... Google, Alexa, you, anybody have one of those names that live, in, live with you and walk around with you? Yes. If you have a smart device, you've gotten familiar with, with those names. Uh, I switched to an iPhone this week after years and years. Oh. I've, been a, I've been an Android user for uh, more than 10 years. Thank you. <laughs> we have a house divided. <laughs> So we're all familiar with Siri or Google. You know, those, those have been around with, uh, with us a little bit longer. Since 2011, uh, Siri uh, was released, and, and uh, those, they do a whole lot for us. We can, we can ask those people to, to make lists for us. They can uh, make alarms go off for us. Or if you're just in a conversation and you can't remember that name that you just have to remember, that person that was in a movie or that athlete that's on that team, or what year your team... Uh, you remember it was like 65 or 60, when was it that Pastor Weaver uh, went to the Little League World Series? You could probably ask Siri and find out. <laughs> but there's this, you know, important information at the moment, and we just pull out our phone, and we can get that information just like right now. All of that uh, stuff that's very, very trivial for sure. But there are questions that those tech gadgets cannot answer. Questions that have to do with the meaning of life, like, who am I? And what am I doing here? Or maybe this question, where am I going? Those are questions of life, and the, the title of the message this morning that I want to share with you, I've just titled it, Answering the Questions of Life. We're in a series that we're starting today in the book of 1 Corinthians, and, and uh, this, is, this is what we're going to talk about today, answering those questions of life. As we start this book, uh, I want to just take a moment while you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
We're going to see that those are the key questions that we need answers for today. But while you're turning there, let me just go back and catch a little bit of the background of the city of Corinth. This is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul uh, to the city of Corinth. Corinth is a city that has been, that dates back to 3000 B.C. So there's been occupation of that site of some kind of a city or a town since 3000 years B.C. Uh, and as, as uh, early as 800 B.C., uh, Corinth became more of a commercial, developed a commercial center. So it was uh, because of its location on, uh, on the coast, uh, with a couple of ports, it became a vital, a vital uh, place of commerce. In the year 146 BC, the rise of the Roman Empire, uh, the Romans took over the city of Corinth and uh, virtually destroyed the city. They killed all the men in Corinth, and they took all the women and children and made them Roman slaves. 146 BC. A hundred years later, in 46 BC, a Roman emperor by the name of Julius Caesar, you've probably heard of him, uh, realized that Corinth was a strategic location, and so uh, he had Corinth uh, rebuilt. They rebuilt that city, and in just uh, a short order of time, Corinth became uh, one of the primary commercial centers of the known world. With those two ports, everything that was traded pretty much went in or out of, of the city of Corinth. Uh, in Paul's time, Paul, the writer of this book of Corinthians, there was an estimated about a half of a million people that lived in the city of Corinth, which is a huge city uh, in a state. It's about the size of the Des Moines metro area. So a pretty big city, uh, and um, because of, because of the, the, the trade and the commerce, and because it was a new city, uh, the, the people that populated Corinth would have been primarily Greeks, uh, but equally uh, Jews and equally Italians. And there were people from all over the known world. So it was a mixing, melting pot of people from all over the world. Um, and with all of that, from coming from all those different parts of the world, uh, Corinth was a, a city with all kinds of, a, a variety of religions and enormous amount of vices. So all of the evil practices of the world, you could pretty much find in Corinth. It was known as, and probably uh, ranks in the top cities of history that would be called sin center, a sin center of the world. So this is the city of Corinth, a very uh, uh, immoral, uh, you could find pleasure of any kind imaginable. The Romans, who were known for uh, debauchery of all kinds, actually coined a phrase, uh, and the word was Corinthianize, and that term was uh, basically to say a person went to the very limit uh, of, of debased sin. And so if the Romans thought something was unique about Corinth, that said a whole lot. So here was a city that was really, really bad. And as I paint that picture, I imagine and think that the culture that we live in today uh, could very much be compared to Corinth. We live in a very sexually um, charged culture where uh, sin uh, and uh, sexual immorality is just a, a click uh, of the mouse away. It's just a click of the uh, TV remote, just one swipe of your computer screen, and you could find things that uh, are as debase and degrading that you can find anywhere. So very much so, I think that the culture that we live in uh, could be compared. The pressure in our culture towards sin and debauchery um, is uh, definitely a war against those who are wanting to pursue a, a life following after Jesus, a life of purity and honoring God. Definitely a struggle for all of us to live in this culture that we live in. So this was the kind of corrupt culture that Paul uh, met when he went on his second missionary journey and when he ultimately founded this church in Corinth. We can turn to Acts chapter 18, and uh, if you want to turn there, you can. I've had you turn to 1 Corinthians, but in Acts chapter 18 is where we see Paul actually in Corinth and where uh, the church in Corinth uh, began. So we pick up in verse 4 of Acts chapter 18. And this is what it says, that every Sabbath he, meaning Paul, reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. 
When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood is on your own heads, I'm innocent of it. From now on, I'm going to only speak to the Gentiles. So he was in the synagogues trying to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. They had nothing to do with that. And so here's Paul shaking the dust off his hands, off his feet, saying, I'm leaving you to yourself. Your blood's on your own hands. Uh, I'm going to go to people who will listen to me. And so that's what he did. Verse 7, then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So a a year and a half spent in this city, a church was planted, and then Paul left uh, to go somewhere else. Actually, he wrote the book of of Corinthians from Ephesus, which was just across the Aegean Sea from where Corinth was. So Paul um, received word that there were problems in the the congregation of Corinth. Um, And so he writes this letter. And it's a letter that he writes, not commending the Corinthians, but really condemning for certain practices, uh, um, bringing correction to a church that had fallen into all kinds of sin and division because of the influence of the culture uh, that was around them. They were assimilating uh, to the culture, much like a frog. uh, You've heard this illustration, a frog in a a kettle of water where the heat's turned up, and it's it's such a gradual uh, heating that he's not even perceiving Uh, of what's going on there to the point of it can become lethal. And so this is the church in Corinth in this this city of sin trying to reach people with the gospel and trying to live uh, the life that God had uh, designed for them, that Paul had preached the good news to them. Now he's writing this letter. Uh, So um, it probably wasn't a surprise when Paul heard that there were problems going on in Corinth. And I would think that uh, maybe his response to this young church, um, you know, who had so quickly fallen into some of these things, that he would have been just a little bit discouraged, like a, a parent whose child just continues to um, push the limits and do things that you're going, why, why, are you do, why do you keep pushing the limits and doing these things? You would think that that would be uh, his tone. But listen to his tone in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as he begins this letter, not of a frustrated or discouraged parent, if, as you'll notice. Uh, This is what it says, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So it would be easy, I think, for Paul to get this news and this information to begin to berate those people that he had discipled and left the the church in the hands with. It would have been easy for him to respond that way, but really what he does is he begins to answer these questions, life's biggest questions. Who am I and what am I doing here? So on the surface, you, you... I don't know if you're getting out of these three verses in Paul's greeting. I mean, it sort of sounds like he's saying, yo, it's Paul, what's up? Really, probably what you got out of this. The beginning three verses of a letter, what do you expect other than, hey, it's Paul, and I'm talking to you. But there's a whole lot more in here, and I want to unpack that just a little bit. Because there's questions, and the question that I think that Paul is answering is this question of, who am I and what am I doing here? And within that, that, those two questions, there are three questions that I think we can answer. The first one is this, who is Paul? He's, he begins by saying, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. What Paul is saying uh, to the Corinthians is, I belong to Jesus. I don't belong to myself. I'm called by God. He recruited me for this job, and it's his will not mine, that I do what I do. I belong to Christ. 
Paul was saying later in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says this, don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. So we as Christians, as followers of Christ, are no longer self-determinant. We're no longer autonomous. We're no longer uh, making our choices for ourselves. You see, there's a popular thought of our day that it's my body and I'll do whatever I want to with my body. Right? You hear that a lot, don't you? It's a woman's choice. It's my choice. I'll decide what I'm doing. I'm in control of my life. And Paul is hitting this head on, head first saying, look, I don't belong to myself. I belong to God. We have this idea that the, my, it's my body and I belong, I'll do whatever I want to. And it's kind of a statement of freedom, but really what it is, it's a statement of really, um, I'm, I'm bound to my own selfish, sinful desires when I'm the one that's making the decision. Paul says, you have been bought with a high price of the blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the sacrifice, the, the Lamb of God who came and shed his blood for the sin of all the world. You've been bought with a high price. Therefore, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to him. He paid for you. He freed you from your sin. And what he did on a cross obligates us to now live for him. So he bought you. He bought your life. The body that you live in is God's temple. It's a temple for his Holy Spirit. So your home has been bought by somebody else. Now it's under new management and there are new rules and you follow the rules of the new manager of the, of the body that you are a tenant, a tenant in. Does that make sense? So you're under new management and there are new rules that you follow. And not rules like, oh man, now I've got a it's, hey, new management, but I've got a new focus. I've got a new freedom. I've got a new purpose. I've got a new mission. I've got a new destination. And it should bring all kinds, all kinds of hope. So it doesn't mean that now all of a sudden we, we don't have an identity. Okay? It just means that we don't make up the rules of what's right and wrong. It's not up to us. It's not up to the culture to tell us what to do. We live by a whole different standard of rules. Paul says, I belong to Christ. Paul, called to be an apostle by the will of God. And so we answer the question, who is Paul? We know who he is. The second question that we answer under this question of life, who am I, is who are the Corinthians? Verse 2 says that, He's writing to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. So what he's saying to the Corinthians is this, I don't belong to myself and you don't belong to yourself. You are God's people and you are God's church. So Paul's saying, even though I had a hand in starting this church in Corinth, you're not my church. You're not anyone else's church. You're God's church. You belong to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. I'm pulling some scriptures out from, from later in this book. He says, we who are many are one body. Who are, who are many become one. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. You are his house. In the book of Ephesians, he writes this in chapter 2, verse 21. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So we belong to God. The Corinthian church, he's saying, you belong to God. They were called to be holy people together. And everyone else who acknowledges Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are part of that building. So in other words, the Corinthian church, the Corinthian Christians weren't just out floating aimlessly on their own. They were part of a bigger family, a bigger body. They had been gathered by God through Paul's preaching. They had been sanctified. They'd been set apart. They'd been washed clean through the blood of Jesus. And now they confessed faith with as many, many other people from around the world. You're not your own. You belong to God, which leads to a third question under this question, and that is, who are we? 
Who are you? Who are we and what are we doing here? Verse 2, he says, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, talking about the Corinthians and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere. Who is that? That's, that's you. That's me. All those everywhere who call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So it's God's plan and his purpose for all people. His, his plan is the same for everyone. Not just the people in Corinth, but us today to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be holy, to become more and more like him every day. You, you aren't a special case, okay? You're, there's, there's nothing um, about you that is worthy of some special exemption from following after the character of Christ. If we've chosen Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we've accepted his sacrifice, his blood that was shed for us, then we're part of his, we're part of his body, we're part of his building, and there isn't anyone here who lives by a different set of rules. We all are part of his church, we're part of his family, and he has the same purpose for all of us. Every Christian, everywhere, for all of time, who calls on the name of the Lord. And here's the deal. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, he hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and he will be the same forever. So it doesn't change this message that was given to the Corinthians 2,000 years ago applies to us today. And it's amazing as we read Scripture how much what happened then applies to us now. We are part of the same body, and God is building us into his church. I'm not saying that every religion follows the same God. You didn't hear me say that. We're talking about everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, because Scripture says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus, they will be saved. That's who he saves. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the way, the only way. There is no other way but through him. He is the way to life. And so it's Jesus Christ that we're talking about. So we're talking about us and who, who are we as you look around the room. You can look around to see who's sitting beside you. Uh, there are a, a variety of people here, a variety of ages, from young to, to very old, we've got a, a, a mix of male and female. We've got so many uh, different abilities and talents and uh, gifts that God has given you. And he has put all of that together to be his body. So the one thing that I can say is that as you look around, there are no superstars here. Paul is saying about himself, look, there's no superstars. We're all part of a team. You can see this week in sports, and it seems like it happens all the time, but something happens of some player, some superstar on some team, and he starts thinking that he ought to be treated di differently or uh, that people ought to say certain things or not say certain things and too much pressure on him to be a leader or whatever it might be. It can really destroy and affect the team. And here's the deal. There's, there's no room for superstars. We're all the same. This is God's church. It's not James Weaver's church. It's not Jeff Hill's church. It's not your church. We belong to God. So there's no superstars, but we're all members of the same team. God has give, given us special roles, special gifts, and sp certain abilities that he has put together, and, uh, and that's what makes it beautiful. I mean, I believe that we've got some great things going on here because we've got great people who are part of this team. It's just absolutely amazing to me. But there's so much more that I believe that God has for us as we submit and surrender and become a team. We're not seeking approval from other people. We seek approval from the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Corinthians were part of probably the cool culture of their day. I mean, if you were from Cor Corinth, I mean, it was the city that was happening and hopping. And so they think there's some special thing about them, um, but they weren't. And, and neither, neither are we. It's not New Hope Assembly of God that saves you and sanctifies you and sets you free. It's Jesus Christ. So who are we and what are we doing? We understand that we belong to Christ, that he has a purpose and a plan, and that, and that plan is for every single one of us. No, no exemptions, no special, no special uh, rules. We're all in this. We're all part of a team. We're doing this together. So Paul not only answers this question, who am I and why am I here? He also answers a second question, which is this, where am I going? Where am I going? Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to say this in verse 4. 
I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So where were the Corinthians going? Where does it say they were going? Listen to what he said. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. What's he talking about? Jesus coming back for his church. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is coming a day when Jesus is going to return for his church. How excited are you for that? They were going to heaven. Three, three, three claps. <laughs> they were going to heaven. Paul's reminding them, look, we need to remember where we're going. Not just who we are and what we're doing here, but where are we going? They were going to heaven. Paul says we eagerly await for Jesus to be revealed. And he will keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on that day. The Lord could come any time. Have you remembered that? Do you, do you think about that? Did, have you thought about that today? Jesus could come back today. How many of you thought about that already? We sang about, did we sing about heaven this morning? Pastor Weaver lead us, led us into when we all get to heaven. Yeah, I feel compelled that I'm going to have to make that up and do that sometime since you didn't do that this morning. When we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all Jesus will sing and shout the victory pastor weaver said that there would be people that would shout in heaven some of you aren't shouters but you will be someday might as well start practicing now there you go a few of you heaven is our home Jesus could come back today. Are you excited about that? Are you as excited? <laughs> this is like a pep rally. It's good. <laughs> are you as excited and anticipating with eager anticipation heaven as much as you are about your vacation next week on spring break? Have you thought about heaven as much and, and so anticipating heaven as much as you are uh, for your summer vacation that's coming up? No? Kids, are you, are you as excited about school getting out at the end of the school year? Are you as excited about heaven as that? See, I, I, it's a challenge to us. How often are we thinking about heaven? Why is it important that we remember heaven? It's important because when we forget where we're going, we can forget who we are. If I am not, if I have not set my goal and my purpose in life to get to heaven, then I'm just out wandering around. And I'm wandering around with no direction, and I really have to ask myself again, who am I? And what am I doing here? All three of these questions go together. We've got to remember where we're going or else we'll forget who we are. We'll forget that Jesus is our purpose, that he is our reason for being, that he's our everything, our all in all. We forget that he saved us, that he's forgiven us of our sin, that he's set us apart to live holy lives for him, and that he's got an eternal reward for a job well done here. And all we've got to do is accept what he's done for us and say, look, now I belong to you. Now I'm living by your rules, and I'm going to heaven. What else are we doing here? We need to be taking people to heaven with us. We got room. Look around you. There's room for more. And when we fill it up, there's always room for more. But I think the problem is we're not, we're not eagerly anticipating, eagerly waiting with anticipation our eternal reward in heaven. Heaven ought to be our focus. It ought to be our goal. It ought to be our destination. We ought to think about it all the time. We are going to heaven. 
So when we forget where we're going, we start believing, we, we start um, forgetting who we are, we start um, believing things that aren't true. Like a lot of people think that be, being a Christian is just being better than the next person. Well, I, I'm, I'm better than so-and-so, or I'm, at least I'm doing this, and it's better than my, my friends who are not saved. Listen, Jesus isn't looking for people who are just better than the average American. That, that's, that's not cutting it. He doesn't want somebody who's just a little bit better behaved. Look at this passage of Scripture in, in Philippians chapter 3. Paul says this, Philippians three seventeen. Join together in following my example. And his example is that Paul was pursuing Christ. He was pursuing Christ's likeness. Join together in following my example. He's saying, look, I'm following, I'm following Christ. You can just follow me. Follow me as I follow Christ. And that ought to be what we do too. Hey, come follow me. I'm going to heaven. I'm following Jesus. Come follow me. It's the way to live. It's what we were made for. It's our purpose. That's the plan that he has for you. I know because that's the plan that he has for me. And that's the plan that he has for everybody. Let's all go to heaven. If we're not focused and planning and going to heaven, what are we doing? Why are you here today? Why are we here? So we start believing these lies. But here's, here's the thing. Oh, I got to finish. I got to finish this verse. What? I got. All right. Paul. <laughs> He's saying, follow my example. Join in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I often have told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. There are many people living as enemies of the cross of Christ. And he's not talking about people outside the church. He is writing this letter to Philippians. He's saying, look, there's some, there's some Jewish people, some Judaizers who, who are all about you following the rules. He's look, he says, they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. He's saying, there are, there are self-indulgent Christian people in the church who only think about themselves. They don't think about anybody else. They don't think about, they don't think about going to heaven. It's all about them. Their destiny, he says, is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I'm so excited for heaven. And I think that we all ought to have a a moment where we recalibrate here and say, what am I doing here and where am I going? This is what we're doing today. Siri can get you just about anywhere in town. She can't get you to heaven. But there's times when you get off the path and you get off the mark and Siri will say, hey, take a U-turn at the next, turn around at the next safe place to turn around. And I think if we'll listen to the Holy Spirit, he's always saying, hey, you you missed an exit. Or you got off at an exit and you weren't supposed to, turn around, get back on the path. Listen to the Holy Spirit. So he wants his people to live lives that are sold out, set apart, sanctified, lived as worship to him. And you say, I've tried all of that. I've tried all that. And I keep following. You say, yeah, who can do that? And my answer to that is no one can. That's why Paul's closing words in this salutation of Romans or of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's faithful. He's called you to fellowship with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, he's not asked you to do this by yourself. You can't do it by yourself. You need him. You need, you need the Lord. You need the Holy Spirit. Last, one of the last verses of, Rome, of 1 Corinthians in chapter 16, a couple of verses that Paul leaves the Corinthians with, and I just want to jump to the end of the book, and we're going to take care of everything in the middle over the next several weeks. But this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. To this Corinthian people, he says, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything in love. 
Be on guard, constantly watchful and alert for spiritual enemies that can slip in and destroy. We've got to be watching. We've got to be alert because there's an enemy that's out to do nothing but to steal, kill, and destroy. We need to stand firm in the faith. The gospel that brought you to salvation is the good news, the gospel that will sustain you in this thing called Christianity, called being a God follower. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous. Stand for righteousness. Stand for holiness. Stand for purity. Be strong in the power of the Holy Spirit that is in you. You are a temple for the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit of God that's in you be strong. Have his power working in you and do everything in love. Because without love, 1 Corinthians 13 says, all I am is a sounding gong and a clanging cymbal. Wah, 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 wah. That's what it sounds like. Who are we? What are we doing here? And where are we going? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I mentioned that Jesus could come back today. If he did, are you ready? You could die today. Would you be ready to make it to heaven? The only way to heaven is Jesus, and I want to offer you Jesus this morning. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here today and you do not, you are not living for Jesus, you've not invited him in, he's not the landlord of your, of your tent that you live in, he's not got control, but you say today, I understand the only way to heaven is through Jesus, and he's the one who created me, and I want to give my life to him. How many of you this morning would just raise a hand and say, I'm not, I'm not in a relationship with Jesus and I need him today? All across the room. You're ready to meet Jesus. If he comes back today, you're ready for heaven. You're right with him. If you're not and you want Jesus, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor Jeff, pray for me today. I'm inviting Jesus into my life. So you're a follower of Jesus. Are you on the right path? Do you know where you're going? Daily, do you know who you are and what you are here for? The answer is Jesus. And as Christ followers, the only way we're gonna get there is to submit and surrender to him. You're a Christian, you're a Christ follower but you've been wandering around. And the Holy Spirit's speaking to you today saying, it's time to recalibrate. It's time to recenter. It's time to get back on course. You've been just kind of wandering around, doing your own thing, calling your own shots. It's not gonna get you where you need to go. How many of you this morning, you're a believer in Jesus, but you'd say, I need to be recentered. I need recalibrated. I need, I need to turn around. I need to get back on the path again. How many of you would say, that's me, Pastor Jeff? Just raise your hand and keep it up so I can see. Father, I pray for every hand raised in this room. Pray for every person in this room. This is your church. These are your people. We are part of your body. This is your plan. We're here for your purpose. I pray for every hand raised, for every person that's sitting in the pew this morning, God, that our hearts would be drawn back into a place of communication, of, of listening to your Holy Spirit, of pursuing you with all of our heart, of saying, Jesus, I'm not my own. I belong to you. God, would you use me? The gifts, the abilities, the things that you've gifted me with to use for your glory and for your purpose. To get on that path, to remember every day that I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm good enough, but because of Jesus Christ who has made all the difference. God, would you challenge us and draw us closer to yourself. We pray in your name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?
This morning, if you raised a hand or you didn't, and you were saying, you know what, I am determining today. It's so easy because we live in this culture and we assimilate more to this culture than we realize. Little by little, we can become like the frog in the kettle. And you say, look, I I don't want to go that way. I want to be set apart. I want to be in a place where I am set apart and I'm listening to God and I'm following his way. Would you, would you, if that, if you're making that choice today, and maybe that's where you're at every day, but you just stand and say, I'm taking a stand today. I'm taking a stand for godliness, for righteousness, for holiness, for purity in a culture that is not that way at all. And I'm making a stand for Jesus today. I want to encourage you to come and make that commitment today as a church to say, that's me. If you want prayer for anything while we sing this song, I want to invite you just to come here in the center. There'll be people that will pray with you, pray for you. If you're sick, if you uh, have some situation that you need prayer for, I'd encourage you to come right here, right here in the middle, and we'll pray for those needs. But if you would come and just make that statement of, I'm with God and I'm going to be all in on Jesus, I'd encourage you to come while we sing this song that talks about who we are. As children of God, we have a lot to look forward to. As children of God, we've got a lot going for us. There's a lot at stake, but we're on a path that's leading the right direction. Do all that you can to stay in that way. Don't live with this false idea that I'm better than the next person. It's all about Jesus. Follow him. You're not looking for the approval of the person next to you. We're looking for the approval of the one who can stamp our passport and say, you're in. You're in. You made it. Well done. Good, faithful servant. Would you live with this perspective every day of your life of heaven? As Christians, that's where we're going. And we need to fill in the spaces around us because that means that there's somebody that's not here. Are they going to heaven? You know people who aren't totally on a different path. Pray for them. It's not the pastor's job. It's not the deacon's job. You go to your place of employment. You live in your neighborhood. You know those people. Be an example. Christ in you. Be the example so they know the way. Let me pray for you, and then we'll go. Father, I thank you so much for your blessings in our lives. I thank you, God, that you have saved us, that you have set us apart, that you have um, sanctified us, making us more and more like you, God, as we submit to you and surrender to you and walk after you. Be people of your word. Be people who listen to your Holy Spirit throughout our days, people who have a, have a, a, a mindset of heaven, We know where we're going. We know who we are. We know what we're here for, and we're all about that mission. We don't know what today holds. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But God, we are going to trust you every day that we live this life, knowing that at the end of our time, at the end of our path, you'll be right there waiting for us. May we live with that focus, the eternal focus of heaven as our home, and Jesus, our Savior, who will forever be, will be together with forever in heaven. We look forward to that day with eager anticipation. May we be citizens of heaven and live with a, a, a citizen mindship that we are, we are citizens of heaven. We love you, Jesus. Help your people. We need you. In Jesus' name.